Do you all notice the nuanced differences in these statements? In the English version, Emu orders the five elders to retrieve Vivi, but the original version has a slightly different nuance. Moreover, the concept of Jinghi in Japanese, which is difficult to translate directly, has been emphasized as an important theme in recent One Piece chapters. As you can see, recent One Piece chapters often use expressions that are challenging to translate directly. In my day-to-day -day work translating manga, websites, and articles from English to Japanese, I often feel the challenges of translating between these two languages. By the way, in this video, I'd like to explain the subtle nuances of Japanese that you might not find on the internet from a native speaker's perspective. Japanese is a language where even a simple expression like, I want to eat sushi, can be phrased in over a hundred different ways, changing based on the character's personality or their emotions at the moment. Reading One Piece with this perspective makes it even more enjoyable. So, through this video, I aim to analyze the subtle nuances in the recent five chapters of One Piece. I've also compiled my personal theories and insights about each chapter, so please stick around till the end. Anyway, welcome to another episode of Dawn Dusk. First, let's focus on this Japanese term. The title Bushin is used for the five elders. Bushin translates to a god who oversees martial arts and protects martial fortune. A synonymous term is Iikusagami, which means god of war. The most famous figure associated with this term in Japan is probably Fudo Miyu. Fudo Miyu is one of the five wisdom kings and is central among them. This term, Miyu, was mentioned by Hyogoro when he saw Luffy in his gear fourth form. It's possible that the origin of the term Miyu in Wano country refers to Joy Boy's appearance when using a technique similar to gear fourth. Given that there are five primary Miyu, there might have been five Miyu in Wano country, with Nika at the center. Similarly, there are five of the five elders. Next, let's focus on Emu's statement. In one translation, it's rendered as retrieve Vivi, but in the original version, it says, I want Vivi. The translation retrieve Vivi would be more aptly translated to Japanese as Vivi wo teni irero. However, since he says Vivi ga hoshi, it gives an impression that rather than speaking from the top position of the world government, he has a more personal sentiment towards Vivi. Given that Vivi is currently being pursued, she might eventually be captured by the world government. This could lead to a scenario where the Straw Hat crew fights the world government to rescue her. Alternatively, she might return directly to the Straw Hats from Morgan's headquarters. In Chapter 1086, it was revealed that Emu was the king of the Nerona family. Ivankov links Emu's name to one of the 20 founders of the world government, Im of the Nerona family. Additionally, Ivankov says Nerona say. This kanji, say, is used to denote the men of the celestial dragons, while for the women of the celestial dragons, the kanji gu is used. So it's almost certain that Nerona Emu is a male. Perhaps this last name, Nerona, could be a play on words. Do you know this kanji? It represents God. Breaking down this kanji, we can find the katakana for ne, ro, and na. So his surname is simply a word derived from God. Anyway, in chapter 1085, Emu refers to himself as Mu. I often hear theories suggesting this Mu refers to Mu in Japanese, which means nothing or void in a philosophical sense. However, I personally don't believe that Mu means nothing or void in the sense of a native Japanese speaker. Why? If that were the case, it should be written as them. There wouldn't be a need for elongated vowel marks, which are a method used to indicate that the sound before a character is extended when writing foreign words in katakana. So, what does mu mean? In the context of native speakers, the sound of mu sounds cute, even a bit silly. This is also the case for other celestial dragons. They refer to themselves as wachiki or wachishi, and so forth. 
These also sound a bit cute and silly to a native Japanese speaker. By the way, the celestial dragons also add the word dai or e at the end of their sentences. This makes their way of speaking somewhat silly. But the five elders don't speak in this way. Additionally, Doflamingo and Miosgard originally spoke in the same way as the other celestial dragons, but after Doflamingo was nearly killed by civilians and Miosgard met Otohime, their way of speaking changed. This could explain it. The five elders are engaged in maintaining the world's balance and are aware that they are constantly in danger. They don't see themselves as gods and seem to even fear that their fanciful positions might be threatened. Doflamingo descended to the surface and became a pirate, while Miosgard decided to live as a human, without slaves. This peculiar and almost silly way of speaking could be common among celestial dragons who consider themselves deities. This could mean that Im, like the other celestial dragons, might have just used Mu to express an unusual way of speaking. There's also another possibility. This word Mu is used to denote the continent of Mu in Japanese. Mu is a hypothetical continent that disappeared in the Pacific Ocean, described by the Anglo-American James Churchward, based on a translation that later turned out to be completely wrong. According to current scientific knowledge, the existence of such a continent is not compatible with the Pacific's geological history. Maybe in the world of One Piece, there exists a phantom continent similar to the continent of Mu, which could be the territory of Marijuana. In this video, I developed the theory that the current world government created a continent in a part of the current Marijuana and linked it with the other continents. This could suggest that the world government truly created a continent that doesn't appear on the map, similar to the continent of Mu. Additionally, I wanted to show you this picture. For the first time, we were able to see the empty throne from above. Maybe some of you noticed something. Now let's look at the next page. I think everyone gets it now. This layout likely represents the map of the One Piece world. This part represents the Grand Line and this part the sea. If this entire area represents the Red Line, then the empty throne where Aim sits represents Maria Joa. In Japanese, the empty throne is said as Karano Jokuza. When this kanji is used, it means not just physical emptiness, but also appearance without substance, lies, falseness, emptiness, etc. So this could mean that Mariwa itself is empty. But why did the current world government create Mariwa? I plan to discuss this in detail in another video, so if you're interested, hit the like button and let me know. In Chapter 1085, the true name of Emu Sama Shot was revealed. As I speculated, it was confirmed that Lulusha was eliminated as an example to other revolutionary countries. Moreover, Ivankov hypothesized that the flying object that destroyed Lulusha could have only been created by Vegapunk, or it could be an ancient weapon. Dragon denies that Vegapunk would create weapons to kill people. From these descriptions, I can perceive the author's intentions. We might conclude that it was Vegapunk who made it, but the subject is deliberately ambiguous. Even if Vegapunk created this mother flame, there must be circumstances. Most likely, this weapon was created for another purpose, or someone else stole Vegapunk's research just like York betrayed. First of all, this shadow is clearly invisible to York and the other Seraphim. So, I am looking forward to returning to Egghead's scene after the break. I have just one more doubt. The five elders say, if we can use this power freely, we can put an end to a long battle. This means that until now, they have not been able to use this power at will. So, the biggest question is about God Valley. According to Sengoku, God Valley disappeared from the map without a trace. How is it possible to make an island disappear from the map? I thought that God Valley was erased with the power of the Mother Flame. Lulusia was indeed erased without leaving a trace. So one possibility is that the world government once used a similar power to erase God Valley, but the weapon itself got out of the control of the world government, just like the Devil Fruit Hitohito model Nika. Or maybe someone else used this power. 
Another possibility is that they used Pluton to erase God Valley. Pluton was hidden underground in the volcano in the country of Wano when Wano was closed. However, since the Pulton project exists, it is possible to create an identical one, and it is possible that there was another Pluton 38 years ago. How do you think God Valley was erased? Let me know your opinions by commenting below. But in any case, it's true that the world government possesses powerful weapons, and since the kingdom of Lulusha actually disappeared, another country might be the next victim. Furthermore, Ivankov also speculated that Narona Emu is the same person who underwent the eternal youth treatment. So, the devil fruit Ope Ope could be a key to fight against Emu. Law is currently on the run after being defeated by Blackbeard, but he might end up fighting the world government alongside the Straw Hat Pirates. In Chapter 1059, Hancock says, The effect of the ability conferred by the previous user of the ability cannot be nullified even by the subsequent user of the ability. In other words, if Iam's immortal status can be nullified using Law's Ope Ope power. But Law is one of the Ds, and wants to know about his destiny and history, so there's no doubt he will be involved in the final battle. At the end of chapter 1086, we see Myosgard being punished and sentenced to death for defending the fishmen. We're still shocked by the death of Navy Vice Admiral T-Bone, but now even a celestial dragon, Myosgard, has been executed. This suggests that also more pirates may die throughout the story. However, the judge who issued the sentence is the current supreme commander of the Knights of God, Figurland Garling. The last name Figurland was mentioned when the five elders misunderstood Shanks as if he had a real daughter in the film Red. In other words, even if it's not confirmed yet, it's almost certain that his last name is Figurland. If Shanks is indeed from the Figurland family, it makes sense that Figurland Garling was at God Valley, because according to Volume 4 Billion, Shanks was found in the treasure chest by Roger's pirates after the God Valley incident. But there's a point we need to pay attention to. Some translations claim that Garling is the former king of God Valley, but in the original version, it's described like this. If he was really the king of God Valley, it should have been described as... Let me explain the difference between Oja and O. O simply indicates the head of a country, so it should be translated as king, but Oja represents the leader of something, regardless of the country. It might be correct to translate it as champion. In other words, there's a possibility that some sort of event or competition took place in God Valley, just like in Hachinosu. And the champion could have been Garling. If Figurland Garling was at God Valley, it's very likely that he was involved in the God Valley incident. So, it's highly probable that he fought against Rox D. Zebek and Whitebeard. I remember a phrase that Whitebeard said to Shanks, When I see your face, the wound that I received from that jerk. I thought he was talking about Roger, but maybe he was really talking about the damage he received from... Garling. Let's take a look at this training scene between Garp and Kuzan. Garp is lamenting the fact that his son became a revolutionary. It's almost certain he's referring to Dragon. However, it's still unclear whether Dragon is his biological son. This is because, in Japan, even a son-in-law can be referred to as Musuko, son. It's the same principle as when Shanks referred to Uta as daughter. Even though Luffy and Garp look similar, Dragon's appearance is distinctly different, suggesting there might be some hidden secret. Another intriguing point is Garp's statement during the Eni's lobby arc. Garp mentioned that he heard from Dragon that he saw Luffy off at Logetown. It seems a bit odd for Garp, a vice admiral of the Marines, to be in contact with Dragon, a revolutionary, even if they are family. Given that Garp has a known disdain for the celestial dragons, it's possible he might have connections with the Revolutionary Army, much like Vegapunk. I'd like to share some personal observations after reading this chapter. In the final scene, 
Avalo Pizarro sprouts two additional arms using the power of the Shima Shima fruit. He then tries to destroy the warship, cutting off Garp and Kobe's retreat. Considering that members of S.W.O.R.D. and the Marines arrived on Garp's single ship, it's hard to imagine things would end so simply with the ship's destruction. At the very least, we can expect Kobe, who will play an important role in future developments, to escape. His actions in this chapter don't suggest total opposition to Garp. Kuzan says to Garp in this chapter, I can't let you go. Let's contemplate the real intent behind this statement. Originally, Kobe was kidnapped to be used as a bargaining chip in making Hachinosu a government-affiliated nation. He is a member of S.W.O.R.D. and a Marine who has submitted his resignation, but is known as a hero to the public. Therefore, Blackbeard believes the Marines can't ignore him and is trying to challenge the public's perception. Naturally, one would interpret, I can't let you go, as referring to Kobe. However, since Kuzan also tells Garp, I can't let you go, it feels like there might be a different intention here. Perhaps Kuzan is secretly considering cooperating with Garp. To substantiate this theory, let's look at another scene. The Blackbeard pirates launched a full-scale attack on Garp after Shir Yu inflicted a fatal wound on him. However, Kuzan tells the pirates, even without his hands and feet, Garp would still beat you. This seems like he's trying to prevent anyone else from killing or capturing Garp. In the next scene, he uses a technique called Ice Glove. Could it be that he tried to make it look like he killed Garp by freezing him? Just like what he did with Sauro? Alternatively, he could simply be trying to confine Garp in a cell, secretly reveal his plan to him, and later join forces to bring down the Blackbeard pirates from within. Let's now delve into the ongoing debate, whether Garp will truly die or not. If we're considering narrative impact, there's a very real chance that Garp could die here. This is because in One Piece, there's a recurring pattern where individuals from the old generation entrust their will to the new generation as they die. Examples include Whitebeard, Izu, Odin, Roger, and Pedro. If Garp were to die here, it would strengthen the narrative of Blackbeard being involved in the deaths of two family members, potentially setting up a clearer motive for Luffy's confrontation with Blackbeard. It also makes Dragon's future actions more intriguing. However, personally, I find a hitch in this theory. Luffy has always fought for the freedom of his friends or for liberation from oppression, not for revenge. In Impel Down, he tried to fight Blackbeard to avenge Ace, but he was stopped by Jinbei. Therefore, I don't think Oda would have Luffy fight Blackbeard for the sake of avenging Garp or Ace. There may be another reason prepared for Luffy to defeat Blackbeard beyond just retribution. Revenge only begets more revenge. At the end of this chapter, Garp says, Don't panic. Justice will surely prevail. The Garp we know would recklessly try to stop Avaro Pizarro's attack, but considering that he seems relatively unflustered even while watching Pizarro attempt to destroy the ship carrying his comrades and citizens, it suggests that Garp might have a secret plan. Let's take a moment to consider the meaning of Garp's words, putting aside discussions about what justice really means. There's an expression often used in Japanese manga, Kobushida Katariao, communicating through fists. This refers to the advanced skill of achieving mutual understanding with someone by fighting rather than exchanging words. In One Piece, Garp embodies this idea the most, and his moniker is even Garp the Fist. Now, let's take a look at the scene just before Garp says that justice will always prevail. It's the scene where Garp and Kuzan fight. In other words, there must have been some kind of exchange between Garp and Kuzan during this scene. This is the conversation through their fists. Furthermore, this chapter showed a flashback between Garp and Kuzan. Flashbacks are often used as a crucial element for the ongoing storyline. The message Oda is likely trying to convey through this flashback 
is that they have always communicated through their fists. Garp didn't initially acknowledge Kuzan. And what did Kuzan do to earn Garp's recognition? Words were unnecessary. Only fists were needed. It can be said that Kuzan grabbed Garp's heart with his fists. Interestingly, Luffy also seems to have communicated with Zephyr and Katakuri through his fists. Another noteworthy detail in this scene is the exclamation mark. Especially when a character notices something, this mark is often used by itself. Let's take a look at the conversation between Sabo and the Revolutionary Army through the Den Den Mushi. When Sabo gave an indirect communication signal with a noise, only Dragon noticed it. And in this situation, the lone exclamation mark was used. Therefore, in this chapter, Garp might have received Kuzan's true intentions through their fist fight. Moreover, in chapter 1081, Garp told Kuzan, those who hesitate are weak. But in this chapter, Kuzan's hesitation is gone, and perhaps Garp was able to understand his true intentions through their fist fight. That's why Garp says, justice will always prevail. Kuzan once told Smoker, I am me, Smoker. It can be inferred that Garp's and Kuzan's notions of justice don't necessarily clash. I'm eager to see what Kuzan does in the next chapter. Considering these possibilities, I think there's a good chance that Garp will survive this situation. Further reinforcing this theory, let's look at the commonalities in the deaths of the Clan of D members. We don't know about Rock's end, but Ace, Rouge, and Roger all died fulfilling their desires. Rouge risked her life to give birth to Ace. Ace found an answer to his question, Was it good that I was born? And Roger created the era of pirates. Protecting Kobe, the future of the Marines, might be worth it, but personally, I believe Garp's true wish remains, and I look forward to it being revealed in the upcoming story. Firstly, a key point in this chapter is that Oda Sensei did not make Garp's death explicit. It's quite plausible that Kuzan froze Garp to keep him alive, much like Sauro. It could even be that he used the ice to staunch the bleeding from the wound inflicted by Shir Yu. You may have heard that the model for Kuzan is a Japanese actor named Yusaku Matsuda. More specifically, the model for Kuzan's personality would be Kudo Shunsaku, a character played by Matsuda, which matches perfectly with Kuzan's appearance. There is a Japanese phrase that succinctly describes Kudo's character. He's humorous and laid back, but always sticks to his principles. The humorous and laid back aspect is reflected in Kuzan's character as well. The phrase suji wo tusu can mean upholding reason or logic, or never betraying those who have shown you kindness, among other things. Thus, in Kuzan's case, killing his mentor, Garp, who raised him, would be a direct violation of this principle. Furthermore, even though Kuzan left the Navy to join the Blackbeard Pirates, it's suggested in his conversation with Smoker that it was to uphold his own sense of justice. From this, we can infer that, like Kudo Shunsaku, Kuzan is a character who adheres to his principles, and I don't think he would allow Garp, to whom he owes much, to be killed. After all, the author, Oda Sensei, is someone who holds traditional Japanese values and would likely not allow a character like Kuzan, who embodies the theme of justice, to act disloyally towards his mentor. Additionally, in manga, when an ally becomes an enemy, they typically change the way they address and speak to that person. However, even after joining the Blackbeard Pirates, Kuzan continues to address Garp with respect, using the honorific, San. His way of speaking to Garp hasn't really changed. Rather, his tone has become harsher towards the Blackbeard pirates who tried to kill Garp. From a native Japanese speaker's perspective, this indicates that Kuzan still views Garp as his mentor. Therefore, 
it's unlikely that Kuzan would have dealt the finishing blow to Garp at this point. Moreover, the closing narration reported that Garp has disappeared in Hachinosu. Let's take a look at other instances where someone was reported missing. Vivi's disappearance, Kobe going missing, Vegapunk's Stella vanishing, the Egghead disappearance incident, and Moria being unaccounted for. Almost all the individuals Oda has treated as missing in the story have subsequently reappeared alive. Besides, Garp is a legendary marine who has faced off against legendary pirates. If Garp were to die here, it would be fitting to depict his death as clearly as Whitebeard's or Odin's. There should have been a bold narration like Garp dies, if Garp did indeed die. But the fact that they chose to ambiguously state that he disappeared suggests that his survival is quite possible. But that's not all. Killing Garp here wouldn't benefit Blackbeard. What I'm trying to say is, keeping Garp alive could prove to be a superior bargaining chip with the world government, even more so than Kobe. Blackbeard has been successful in almost all his plans to acquire what he wants. Currently, all the captains from the first to the tenth ship are Devil Fruit users. He also managed to defeat the Uchoku and become the boss of the pirate island Hachinosu. Although it's not explicitly shown, he probably obtained a copy of the Big Mom Pirate's Road Poneglyph when he kidnapped Pudding. There's also a high possibility, although not directly portrayed, that he's already taken the copies of the Mokomo Dukedom and Wano Country's Road Poneglyphs from Law. So what is Blackbeard's next objective? There are two clear goals within the storyline. Finding the last Road Poneglyph and turning Hachinosu into a world government member nation. As for the road poneglyph, in one of my previous videos, I predicted that Loki might possess it. But if Loki truly has it, why did Oda have Shiryu state, I assume the government has it? I believe this might be a hint for a future storyline where Blackbeard confronts the Marines. If Shiryu assumed the government had the last road poneglyph, then there is a chance that Blackbeard might head to Maria Joie or the Marine Headquarters to steal it. Moreover, Blackbeard was attempting to make Hachinosu a world government member nation by using Kobe, hailed as a hero by the citizens, as a hostage. Blackbeard pirates failed in capturing Kobe in Chapter 1088, but now he has a better bargaining chip, the hero of the Marines, Garp. Let's look at the flashback in Amazon Lily from Chapter 1088, Contrary to what he learned in Garp's first lesson, Kobe volunteered himself as a captive to save many other Marines. While the inclusion of this flashback in Chapter 1088 might be to emphasize Kobe's determination and belief, I also feel it's clearly intended to remind readers about Blackbeard's objective. In Amazon Lily, Blackbeard demanded 800 Marines and warships from the Marines. This was likely for negotiating Hachinosu's membership in the world government, However, he saw Kobe as a more valuable bargaining chip than 800 generic marines and took him hostage. Here, the past section from Chapter 1080 becomes a crucial piece. When it was revealed that Kobe was a part of S.W.O.R.D., Kuzan suggested to Blackbeard that he should give up on the negotiations with the world government. However, Blackbeard believed Kobe was sufficient as a negotiation tool since he is recognized as a hero of the marines by the public. And now, fortunately, the Blackbeard pirates have obtained a genuine hero of the Marines who is not part of S.W.O.R.D. This will likely open up more room for negotiations with the government. Knowing Blackbeard's ambitions, Kuzan can argue that Garp, his former mentor, is an even more appropriate bargaining chip than Kobe. This is a situation where he can save Garp's life. The flashback in Chapter 1088 connects all these dots. Garp taught Kobe in his first lesson that in a crisis, he should prioritize protecting himself and children over the elderly. It has become clear that Garp values the youth who can carry the future more than the elderly who don't have much time left. He probably taught this same philosophy to Kuzan, his former number one disciple. 
Indeed, a figure resembling Kuzan can be spotted when Garp is being chastised. Hence, I believe Kuzan understood during their fist talk that Garp intended to save the young Marines with a future, like Kobe, and sacrifice himself. So, as I explained in this video, I believe that's why Kuzan said to Garp, I can't let you escape, rather than to Kobe, who was a hostage. If Kuzan had let Garp be free, Garp would have tried to free all the Marines from Hashinosu and fight all the pirates. Given that the surrounding pirates were after the 30 billion reward of Cross Guild, Garp wouldn't stand a chance. Hence, before Garp really gets killed, Kuzan freezes him to momentarily pacify the surrounding pirates. He'll then likely suggest to Blackbeard that keeping Garp alive would be beneficial for negotiations with the world government. Furthermore, with Garp held hostage, we might learn more about the past of rocks and the reason why Blackbeard is using Zabek's name for his ship through their conversation. I believe there's a high possibility that Kuzan will eventually betray the Blackbeard pirates, but even if he doesn't, I cannot imagine him willingly killing his mentor, Garp. Therefore, this was the best course of action for Kuzan. From this, I expect the Blackbeard pirates will use Garp as a hostage to negotiate Hachinosu's membership in the world government. The Blackbeard pirates might invade Mariawa for this negotiation, during which they would also likely aim to accomplish another goal, obtaining the last road poneglyph. Since Shiryu was assuming the world government has it, Shiryu, Katerina Devon, and Lafitte would likely scour the interiors of Mariajwa using their respective abilities. During this time, the Blackbeard pirates might even encounter Im. This might be when Blackbeard finally moves to crush the world government and the Marines. In other words, the second coming of rocks. I still have more to say about this, so I will introduce it in the next video. If you're interested, please hit the like button and stay tuned. And the final scene of Chapter 1088 closed with a narration that Yonku Straw Hat Luffy is taking Egghead Island as his stronghold. A ship of the Blackbeard Pirates was also spotted on Egghead. It's plausible to assume that both Lafitte and Devon were certainly on board this ship, as they were not seen in Blackbeard's room after he had brought Kobe back from Amazon Lily to Hachinosu. Therefore, after returning to Hachinosu with Blackbeard, Devon and Lafitte likely headed towards Egghead. But what is their purpose for going to Egghead? Blackbeard and Devon had confronted Seraphim on Amazon Lily. Recognizing Seraphim as a pacifista, Blackbeard might have sent Devon and Lafitte to Egghead to acquire this Vegapunk technology as a force in their arsenal. As mentioned earlier, the abilities of Devon and Lafitte are ideal for infiltration. Interestingly, the angles of the views on Egghead from the Blackbeard pirate's ship and the government's warship seemed slightly different. It appeared as though the warship arrived on the left side of the Blackbeard pirate's ship. However, if the Blackbeard pirate's ship was present, the government should have noticed it right away. The Blackbeard pirate's ship might have backed off once they became aware of the arrival of the government's warship. Considering that many of the government's forces are currently dedicated to Egghead, it could be the perfect timing for Blackbeard to go to Mariwa for negotiations if he intends to do so. This chapter began with a scene from Fusha Village. Makino's baby made an appearance, and this whole sequence reminds us of Nami's story when she was a baby. Makino's baby started crying when scolded by the village chief. However, the moment the baby saw Luffy's picture, it changed to a smile. Similarly, Nami used to burst into tears whenever she saw Genzo, the village chief, because she found his face scary. But the moment he put a windmill on his head, she would instantly smile. By the way, someone from Fusha Village commented on the article about Garp saying, it doesn't say he's dead, right? Typically, Oda Sensei makes it clear when a character has died. However, in cases like this, where the death scene isn't explicitly shown, 
it usually turns out later that the character is alive. This was the case with Sabo and Vivi. So, as previously speculated, there's a high likelihood that Garp is still alive. Let's examine the contents of the letter from Lily that Cobra spoke about just before he was killed by Emu. This part of the dialogue is drowned out by some sort of roar. This roar is likely from Cobra going insane due to the chaotic situation. I'm kidding. It's probably the roar of the five elders in their beastly forms. So, what was Cobra trying to say? We'll try to figure out some Japanese phrases that might fit in that part. The focus here is on this phrase. This expression is often used in poetry and story narration. Those who are knowledgeable about Japanese might know that this yuku is an archaic expression of the verb iku, meaning to go. And when yuku is used in an archaic manner, it is often connected to other verbs. When yuku is attached to a verb, it can express the state of becoming something. Let's look at some commonly used expressions in Japanese. A world falling apart, a sinking world, dying people. As you can see, this expression is often used in a negative context. So in this letter, what state of the world is Princess Lily urging the future kings of Alabasta to raise the flag of dawn in? Personally, I think inserting a sinking world here would make the sentence sound most natural to a native speaker. Moreover, after reading chapter 1089, this makes sense contextually. That's because the sea level around the world has indeed risen by one meter due to Emu's use of the mother flame. And many beaches around the world have disappeared, with some islands vanishing completely. Incidentally, the fact that Alabasta's royal palace stands on high ground may be because one of the previous kings who read Lily's letter was afraid of the world sinking. Alabasta is a desert country, where securing water is most vital for its people. Yet ironically, Lily foresaw a future where lives would be taken away by water. At this point, a theory comes to mind. The theory is that the world government is deliberately planning to submerge the world in a flood. The root reason for the royal families of the 20 kingdoms, which formed the world government, to ascend the red line might have been because they ultimately planned to cover the world with the sea. I think Lily, knowing this, may have betrayed the world government to stop their plan. But why would the world government want to sink the world in the sea? I think it's because they are trying to completely wipe out the countries associated with the great kingdom that they opposed. In fact, in One Piece, there are several locations that have sunk to the bottom of the sea, and it turns out that all of these places were involved with the great kingdom. Firstly, let's consider Water 7. As Frankie says, the city you see now is built on the remnants of the ancient civilization. A long time ago, the lower part of the city, which is submerged today, was part of the same island, along with the higher area where the shipyards are located. The shipbuilders who created Pluton back then probably had the knowledge of the advanced technology of the Great Kingdom, which allowed them to create a warship capable of destroying an entire island. Next, consider the undersea ruins depicted in Jinbei's cover story. Jinbei found a poneglyph here. The people who lived here might have been protecting this poneglyph, like the people of Shandia. Then there's the Golden City, Chandra. At first glance, Chandra seems to have been a regular, unsinkable island. But do you remember where the ancient city is located? It was below the ground level of Jaya. Kargara, having trusted Noland, decided to reveal the City of Gold to him. At that time, they descended the stairs to reach the ancient city. It felt strange that a thriving city was located underground, but if this is also a result of the world sinking, it makes sense. Finally, Impel Down. It is located in the middle of the Calm Belt, and countless sea kings reside around it. It seems impossible to construct such a building underwater, so it is natural to think that a facility that was originally on the ground has sunk underwater. 
Given the sun-like mark on the upper part of Impel Down, and the ancient text drawn on the wall, similar to what is seen on poneglyphs, it can be assumed that it was a facility related to the Great Kingdom. It's also probable that this is where Who's Who first heard about the legend of Nika. All the places that are sunk at the bottom of the sea are seemingly associated with the Great Kingdom or facility. With the acquisition of Mother Flame, which is as powerful as the ancient weapons, isn't it possible that the world government is again advancing this plan? Incidentally, in Chapter 1089, York made an uncertain promise to the Five Elders, offering them Mother Flame in exchange for her life, while also elevating herself to a celestial dragon. It is not yet clear whether the term Mother Flame refers to a weapon in itself or to a convertible source of energy. But the fact remains that an island was destroyed by an attack using Mother Flame. According to York, the power plant that generates Mother Flame is located in Egghead. This could be one of the big reasons why the government doesn't want to order the destruction of Egghead, as Borsellino mentioned. With the freedom to use Mother Flame attacks, the government could easily eliminate inconvenient nations. The earthquakes produced by these attacks, although their relevance is unclear, could possibly hasten the process of sinking the world into the sea. The flag of this world government might also be suggesting that it will bore a hole into the world. In any case, I believe there is definitely a connection between this massive hole and the rise in sea level. The giant hole in Eni's lobby is a prime example of this. That's because the sea level in the waters where Water 7 exists, which is located nearby, continues to rise. The entire world of One Piece might have been sinking for 800 years, perhaps even longer. In fact, there's a structure in the world of One Piece that bolsters this theory. Some of you might have thought of this already. Tequila Wolf. The purpose of this construction is still unclear, but it has been explained that it's being carried out by Order of the Celestial Dragons since 700 years ago. If the goal of the world government is to sink the world into the ocean, it seems only natural to build a bridge in preparation for that time. Given that the bridge is being constructed in the East Blue, there might be something of importance to the world government there. Consider this. The reason why St. Yalmak visited the remote kingdom of Goa. The discovery of the Hito Hito fruit model, Nika, in East Blue. Shanks continuing his journey in East Blue, even after stealing this devil fruit from a government convoy. Logetown being called the Town of Beginnings and Endings. And young Roger, before reaching Raftal, inexplicably saying to Rayleigh, let's turn the world upside down. Roger hails from Logetown in the East Blue. Taking these facts into account, it seems clear that something fundamentally important to the world of One Piece exists in East Blue. Additionally, in Chapter 1089, everyone's favorite whoop slap made a long-awaited appearance. Personally, I feel like he knows something significant. When Luffy set sail from Fusha Village to become a pirate, Whoopslap lamented his decision. When Makino reassured him, saying that becoming a pirate had always been Luffy's dream, Whoopslap said, Yumeka, Sadameka. He used the word Sadame at this time. The original reading of the kanji for destiny is Unmei, but in this case, it is read as Sadame. Both Unmei and Sadame can be translated as destiny in English but they have subtly different nuances in Japanese. Unmei represents the fortune or misfortune that comes around, despite or beyond one's will. In the story of One Piece, this term Unmei is often used when the letter D is mentioned. Hey, Korasan, I really want to know the meaning of this strange destiny. D is always filled with a strange fate. On the other hand, Saddam denotes an unavoidable fate that's predetermined in life. Thus, Whoopslap wasn't hinting at something vague like the destiny of D, but implying that Luffy becoming a pirate was predestined from the start. 
Why he knows this, and what exactly Luffy's destiny is, may be explained in future stories. Finally, let's speculate on the next steps the world government might take. In the present world, revolutionary movements are intensifying, and pirates are gaining strength. In other words, the world's balance is starting to falter. Perhaps Lily anticipated this future and wished for someone to rise and protect the people of the world, starting with the citizens of Alabasta, which is why she may have released the Poneglyph. Therefore, it is highly probable that when you fully decipher Lily's letter, it might read as follows. Protect the Poneglyphs, raise the flag of dawn in a world that is sinking. Indeed, Cobra once told Robin about the Poneglyphs, the royal family of Alabasta is obligated to protect this. This seems to confirm that the to protect, mentioned in Lily's letter, refers to the Poneglyphs. Emu asked Cobra for the real name of the sender of Lily's letter just before Cobra's death. For the first time, Emu learned that the name D was also attached to Lily. And immediately after that, the attack on Cobra began. The reason they had left Alabasta, governed by the traitorous Nefertari family, untouched until now, might be because they weren't sure whether Lily had blundered or betrayed them. But now, Emu and the Five Elders know that the Nefertari family carries the name of their opposing forces. Whether the world government can still launch an attack on Lulucia is unclear. However, if they get their hands on Mother Flame, they will certainly decide on the next nation to target. The most likely next target would probably be Alabasta. First, let's focus on the cover art. Clahador, back in the day, remarked when he saw a crescent moon, on nights like this, my heart races, or rather, my blood stirs. Yet in this cover, despite the crescent moon, he's calmly reading a book. Perhaps something has changed in his heart since the Syrup Village incident. We don't know if we'll see him again in the remaining story, but he might play a role in the war that's engulfing the world. Next, let's look at the scene where Luffy talks to the five elders via Denden Mushi. When I saw information about Chapter 1090 in English, I often noticed descriptions suggesting Robin was angry at Luffy. However, from the original version of Robin's phrase, I can't sense any anger towards Luffy. The rounded font used suggests that Robin is more soothing than angry. What's more concerning is that during this call, Shepherd Jew Peter noticed Robin's presence. This might hint that Lucci might be instructed to capture Robin. Considering that the five elders had previously ordered CP0 to capture Robin in Wano, this is a strong possibility. However, Lucci has promised that he won't lay a hand on the Straw Hat crew unless he defeats Luffy. Lately, the concept of Jinghi, which can be translated as humanity and justice, or honor and duty, has been emphasized in One Piece. In the context of One Piece, it refers to upholding promises with others and fulfilling one's role or position. Isho, being an admiral in the Navy, had no choice but to fight Luffy due to his position. Shanks, being one of the four emperors like Luffy, chose not to meet Luffy because his territory was disrupted by Luffy's subordinate. Borsellino also decided not to ignore Sentomaru in order to uphold his sense of honor and duty. Given this, it's believed that Lucci will uphold his honor and keep his promise with Luffy. Therefore, before targeting Robin, it's possible that Vegapunk, Stussy, or Bonnie might be the ones in danger. By the way, let's also check Usopp's remark at this time. In the English version, he says, don't underestimate the Marines. However, in the original, he humorously comments, the Navy's too soft. Furthermore, let's look at the scene where Saturn instructs what should be protected by Egghead. The translated version says, the power plant needed to produce the Mother Flame. In the original, it says Mother Flame wo umu. The verb umu isn't exactly equivalent to produce. Umu is often used when living organisms reproduce. 
It can be used for inorganic things, but in such cases, it's used when substances or energy are produced due to chemical changes. For manufactured products or weapons, seizu suru or tsukuru would be more appropriate. This suggests that the mother flame produced by the power plant is likely energy. There's also a non-negligible possibility that it might be a living entity or something akin to a creature. Additionally, let's look at the scene where Saturn belittles humans. He uses the verb hanshakusuru, like the verb breed. In Japanese, when talking about population increase, the verbs zoukasuru or fueru are typically used. The verb hanshokusuru is primarily used when the subject is a non-human organism. This emphasizes that Saturn perceives humans as mere bugs or animals. I felt the five elders were closer to humans than other celestial dragons, but it's clear they view humans as inferior. Their human appearance might be a facade, and the beast-like silhouette might be their true form. Lastly, S. Hawk's remark is interesting. He says, how dare they lock in such a thing? Considering Mihawk's usual calm demeanor, this yagati, vulgar Japanese phrasing is unexpected. Maybe a younger Mihawk was more hot-tempered. Another point of interest is that while S-Snake had information about Luffy recorded in his lineage factor, it seemed that S-Hawk had no recollection of fighting with Zoro. This might suggest that Mihawk's lineage factor was taken earlier than Hancock's, or perhaps Hancock recognized Luffy at a genetic level. In chapter 1090, it was revealed that Robin, Edison, and Kaku are injured. Given that Robin, along with Atlas and Chopper, was headed to a sealed-off underground research lab, it can be inferred that they engaged in combat with York there. Robin's Hanahana no Mi abilities were likely essential in capturing York, and she must have sustained injuries during that confrontation. After capturing York, Robin, Atlas, and Chopper probably released Dr. Vegapunk. They might have then used a bubble containing sea prism stone components created by Vegapunk to restrain Seraphim. In the recent chapter, it was revealed that the command to Seraphim by York has not yet been lifted. The most puzzling aspect, however, is that S-Snake was unable to resist Luffy's commands. Seraphim are programmed to only obey direct orders from the five elders, Vegapunk, Sentamaru, and Chip owners in that specific hierarchical order. Luffy, being neither Vegapunk nor one of the five elders, shouldn't inherently have this control. Yet, as Vegapunk hypothesized, it might be possible that information transmitted through lineage factors made this obedience possible. In fact, Pythagoras, who was observing the battle between the Seraphim and the Straw Hat crew, mentioned, Is it possible that experiences are recorded within lineage factors? This suggests that sometimes information from lineage factors might be prioritized over the original programming. Clearly, in the world of One Piece, the power of human will is paramount, and it seems that this will might also be recorded in lineage factors. This might explain events like the laughter of Sindri, who should technically be dead. Perhaps it's a lingering will imprinted upon the body. Considering the thought of the five elders that the Zoan-type devil fruits host individual wills, they theorized that the Hitohito fruit, model Nika, might also be continually evading the world government due to Nika's will. It's possible that the foundation of the power of Zoan-type devil fruits stems from the information transmitted through lineage factors, birthing this so-called will. One of the central themes of One Piece, the inherited will, could also manifest through the power of the devil fruits. This aligns with Sabo's resolution even before obtaining the flame flame fruit. We will carry on Ace's will. The fact that S-Snake has feelings for Luffy implies that she might have inherited Hancock's will. This suggests that Hancock's lineage factor was extracted after her encounter with Luffy, likely either during her visit to Impel Down or during the Summit War when seven warlords convened at Mary's Wah. Either way, this implies that in human years, S-Snake is roughly two years old. 
Moreover, Yanji mentioned in Chapter 840 that it takes five years to produce a 20-year-old clone, suggesting that clones age approximately four years for every one calendar year in the world of One Piece. Indeed, while S-Snake is technically two years old in human years, her appearance is that of an eight-year-old girl. A question arises regarding Esper. While the current Seraphim mainly appear to be around eight years old, as seen in the SBS, Esper noticeably looks older than the others. This might be because Vegapunk had already been using Kuma's lineage factor for his research on the Seraphim, even before obtaining the lineage factors of other members of the Seven Warlords. In fact, it seems that the encounter between Vegapunk and Kuma dates back quite some time. This leads us to the intriguing point that Kuma belongs to a unique race. As discussed in this video, Kuma is from the Sorbet Kingdom and the Lunaria tribe to which Albul belongs. Both names seem to represent the sun and the moon, respectively. This suggests that while the Lunaria tribe has a name associated with the moon, Kuma's race might be related to the sun. Let's look at Nika's description. Awakening grants the rubber body even more arm strength and freedom, a power that's said to be the most ludicrous in the world. While gaining freedom through awakening sounds typical of Nika, the addition of arm strength seems to be another significant characteristic of Nika. In the original version, it was not the power of Nika's entire body that was mentioned, but rather the strength of his arm. Scenes showing Nika's arm strength augmenting reminds one of Kuma's arms. Jinbei's accounts suggest that Vegapunk was enamored by Kuma's latent muscular strength, leading me to think there's a connection between Nika's strength and Kuma's potential muscle power. Regarding Nika, as mentioned in this video, the goddess illustrated in the book Kuma Holds and the bronze statue in Flavance might be modeled after Nika. This brings to mind the Statue of Liberty. The theme of freedom resonates with both Nika and the Statue of Liberty. The tablet in the Statue of Liberty's left hand recalls the Bible Kuma always holds in his left hand. Moreover, the torch in her right hand is reminiscent of the flames on the backs of the Lunaria tribe members. Albul's mask ornament also slightly evokes the Statue of Liberty. This suggests that Nika might be associated with both Kuma's race and the Lunaria tribe. Personally, I believe there's a possibility that Nika could be an ancestor of both Kuma's race and the Lunaria tribe. I'd like to delve deeper into this in another video. And in the final part of chapter 1090, Borsellino finally made his move. However, personally, I don't believe Borsellino will pose a significant obstacle for Luffy and his crew. This is primarily because there's a chance that he doesn't entirely trust the world government. Consider Borsellino's statement. <laughs> The term shachiku is a modern slang term in Japan, often used in a self-deprecating context. It likens oneself to livestock owned by a company, indicating dissatisfaction with their company, but an inability to do anything about it. In Japanese, the term for livestock is kachiku. This is precisely why company employees are often referred to as shachiku, Furthermore, Borsellino's idea of justice is dochi tsukazu no seigi, ambiguous justice. The term dochi tsukazu refers to situations that are not clearly defined or decided. Yet as of now, Borsellino is solidly on the side of the Marines. In Japanese, siding with the world government is phrased as sekai seifu ni tsuku, and siding with pirates is kaizoku ni tsuku. Dochi Tsukazu indicates not taking a clear side. Regardless, I don't think Borsellino will support Luffy and his crew, but there's a considerable chance that he might defy the world government's orders or act independently. 
I personally suspect that Borsellino might assist in helping Sentomaru escape from Egghead in the end. Sentomaru was also summoned by Vegapunk, and despite it being his day off, he was made to report to Egghead. Moreover, he was forcefully coerced by Vegapunk to rebel against the Marines. Such actions are referred to as power harassment or pawahara in Japan. Including Borsellino's Shachiku remark, there are various hints in the Egghead arc that use the inner workings of the Marines to allude to the dark aspects of Japanese corporate structures. Isho would undoubtedly be treated as a maverick if he were in a Japanese company. The owner of this channel chose not to work in a Japanese company for such reasons, instead operating as an independent entrepreneur, working on translations and marketing. Of course, Japan's corporate structure is gradually improving. Based on the story, Sentomaru is essentially a regular office worker. In Japan, such employees are referred to as salarymen. Additionally, I believe Sentomaru's character is inspired by Kintaro. The presence of a weapon called a Masakari and the appearance alongside a pacifista, which is based on Kuma, aligns with the traditional image of Kintaro. This brings to mind a particular manga, Salaryman Kintaro. This manga was serialized in Young Jump. Its protagonist becomes a salaryman in a company named Yamato Construction. Incidentally, the manga began its serialization in 1994. Now, let's look at the title of Chapter 994, also known as Yamato. The name Yamato is prominently used. Some of you might have already noticed. What do Yamato and Sentomaru have in common? It's the rope on their backs. This is used in traditional Japanese kabuki theater and is called a Neo Dasuki. Perhaps Salaryman Sentomaru will be rescued from Egghead by Borsellino and then head to Wano country to meet Yamato. The opening of the Borders event still remains in Wano, and it's anticipated that the world government will try to take control of Wano. Sentomaru might collaborate with Yamato to combat the world government during this time. As for how the Straw Hat crew will escape Egghead, I made a prediction in this channel's first video half a year ago. It's likely the Straw Hat Grand Fleet will come to their aid at Egghead. Given they're currently surrounded by the Marines' warships, the best counter would probably be Orlumbus's Grand Fleet. On his ship, there's a depiction of an egg, so perhaps even a chicken will come. Furthermore, in the video, I theorized the following. During the Egghead incident, the dark secrets of the world government that Kuma possesses might spread worldwide. Kuma's surname is Bartholomew, which in Italian is Bartolomeo. Perhaps he'll play a role in disseminating Kuma's memories to the world. The primary objective of the world government's recent strategy was to assassinate Vegapunk. Despite this, their hesitation to destroy Egghead probably stems from their desire to acquire the punk records, the brain of Vegapunk, and the power plant that produces the Mother Flame. This suggests that if the Straw Hat crew manages to escape Egghead with Vegapunk, they would likely go to retrieve the punk records and the power plant. They might even try to obtain the Seraphim, who is presumably currently underground. I personally think there's a possibility that the Blackbeard pirates might appear at this juncture. During the Summit War, Blackbeard made his move when both the Marines and the Whitebeard pirates were significantly weakened from battling each other. If a conflict between the Straw Hat Grand Fleet and the Marines were to erupt at Egghead, we might see a similar situation unfold. While it's uncertain whether Blackbeard is aware of the existence of the power plant and punk records, he definitely knows about the Seraphim. Blackbeard went to the Island of Women to obtain the Mero Mero fruit, but couldn't acquire its power due to Rayleigh's intervention. However, if the Blackbeard pirates managed to secure the S-Snake, Blackbeard's objective would be fulfilled. Given that most of his goals have been accomplished thus far, this scenario seems plausible. With an authority chip, 
even Blackbeard might be able to control the Seraphim. Additionally, Lafitte's hypnotism might come into play as well. 